Uh, good morning, everyone. It's now we are we now here with a philosopher Emmanuel Goffi, direct from France, and our professor Tiago, direct from São Paulo State in Brazil. And to greet you honor for us, Prof, uh, philosopher Emmanuel, uh, to have you that is specialized a philosopher, a thought in. in the we all know your busy schedule and the separate time to to stay with us to share your knowledge and so important for us to to listen you to learn with you and professor manuel uh, he's a philosopher of artificial intelligence he's a co-director and co-founder of the global ai ethics institute that me and Professor Tiago is a member of it, and we thank a lot of it. And he's also a constant AI ethics with Huawei, and as well as a member of the Spectrum team in Germany, and a research fellow with the Center for Defense and Security Studies at the University of Minitoba in Canada. Dr. Graffi, research, focus on the development of artificial intelligence in the ethical dimensions through a multicultural approach. Thank you to stay with, with us and the floor is yours. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's a really great honor for me to, uh, to be here with you. Again, I would say that I'm, I'm, it's, it's always really a delight to, uh, to be with, with you from Brazil, uh, not only because Brazil is a country that makes me dream a lot, but also because you've always been so friendly with me that uh, it, it's once again a, a real pleasure. Uh, as, as you've mentioned it, uh, uh, I'm part of many groups working all around the world uh, on AI ethics in, in Canada, in Germany, uh, working a lot with you guys in, in Brazil, definitely, uh, working also with the International Group of uh, Artificial Intelligence, which is based on the uh, Arabic Peninsula and Bahrain. Um, so th this gave me this, um, this very sense of the importance of, of culture in, in the way we see ethics, obviously, and the way we see ethics when it is applied specifically to AI. So I, I just want to uh, uh, to make some point about that and try to, once again, I do not I do not hold any kind of truth. I just want to raise awareness about the fact that the cultural dimension of ethical appraisal is something that must be taken into account. And I think, and I think you, uh, my friend Paolo and, and, and Tiago are, are perfectly aware of that. So my point is that I hope that our audience will be aware of that after this presentation. So, uh, so next slide, please. Next, Rodrigo. Yeah. Great, thank you. So uh, it's, it's all about uh, definitions and obviously lots of people that are working in the field of sociology, anthropology would definitely say, okay, culture is a really, really difficult concept to, to define. And I would definitely agree on that. Uh, there has been a really interesting paper, really long paper that has been written in the uh, early fifties uh, by Kober and Kruk on, and they actually identified uh, no less than 164 definitions uh, of, of what culture is. And then from those 164 definitions, they've just created the one that you have here. Um, obviously, it's imperfect. Uh, we all agree on that. But I just want you to know that this is the definition of culture that I will use, basically. And especially, uh, I, I um, underline that in, in, the, in the document, uh, that there is a strong link with, between culture and ideas and values, which are also at the base of ethics. So when we talk about culture, obviously there is this dimension that is related to values, to the cultural value system, which is also at the base of, of ethics. So when you think about values, you also have to think about culture because values depend on the culture, on your history uh, at large. Uh, so there is this, this, this strong link, and I guess that even if you look at other kinds of definitions, there is a lot of them, once again, you will always see this idea that culture is based on the relation of human beings as individuals to the community they live in and to the history and the past and all that has been uh, gained throughout history by this, by this, by this community and, and this, this society. So there is a, uh, a continuous relation between the society, individual, the values, the culture. Okay, next slide, please. 
so I'm, I've just I've just tried to uh, make a kind of a representation of all that, and I will try to go through it uh, with you. The focus that we have today is, and, and which is basically the focus that we all have around AI, and especially because, as we've seen that with with my friend Tiago quite recently, uh, with the uh, uh, the, uh, the Brazilian AI bill, there is this strong focus on ethics applied to artificial intelligence. Uh, at some point, it is a little bit concerning because it, it, it actually we understand that ethics is, is central in, 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 in AI. Why well, it is not? Next, please. And actually, ethics is just a small part of the big picture. You can see it here. And ethics, and I will, I will try to explain you what ethics is about, is basically the evaluation of a specific action at a specific moment which is different from morality. Morality is the set of norms that are pre-existing. They are already there. You know that there are things that are acceptable in your community that are not acceptable. But at some point in a specific situation, you will take that into account with some other elements and you will make a decision. And the ethics is about this decision, right? And sometimes this ethical decision might differ from the moral obligation. Let's say that the moral obligation would say you must not kill, okay, which is a really Christian perspective, right? But at some point, if you're assaulted, your wife is assaulted, your husband is assaulted, your kids are assaulted, maybe these moral norms will not be respected. So you might kill in some situation, right? So you can see that there are moral norms on one hand and ethical um, behavior on, on the other hand. Next, please. So when something uh, happens, any kind of event, and you have to make a decision regarding ethics, you will take all the elements that are uh, in your hands, the moral obligations, the legal obligation, the situation, your values, uh, your psychology, lots of things, and you will make a decision. Uh, next, please. When there is this kind of situation, what happens and that what we don't know is that there is not only one ethic, there is not only one decision that can be made. There is a lot of ethical decision that can be made, not only by you, but also by all the people that are surrounding you. you maybe you are aware that uh, we are currently in, uh, in the very beginning of a trial uh, here in France, uh, which is about the terrorist attacks that we've suffered in Paris in 2015, right? And, and when something like that happens, you get a tourist attack, uh, let's say in a cafe or a restaurant on a terrace, then you will have different people that are experiencing exactly the same event at the same moment, but they will react differently. And this is based on ethical decision. Do I run away? Do I help people? Do I help my friends first? Do I help elder first? Do I help uh, youngest people? Do I call the police? And this is all about, okay, I have to make a decision, right? So I know that there are obligations, I must help, but maybe I'm too scared, so I will just run away, right? Uh, lots of people will definitely judge me on that, but that's an ethical decision that you have to make. For the same event, different, different kind of ethics. Next, please. This uh, ethical decision, obviously, they are part of a bigger, as I was uh, telling you just uh, earlier, uh, a big set of moral principle. Obviously, you cannot just withdraw ethics from morality. When you're making a decision at, a some, uh, at, at some point, you will take into account the moral obligation, right? And you will feel, okay, if I don't help those people that are in need, maybe afterwards I will be judged not legally speaking, but morally speaking. So maybe my image could be at some time, at some point jeopardized and, and maybe some people would criticize me because I was not helping, right? Next, please. When I make this kind of um, uh, decision, obviously I also take into account the laws, right? The rules, the positive rules that are here. It's not only about moral obligation, it's also about legal obligation. And in France, I don't know for Brazil, but if you do not help someone that is in a strong need, you can be sued for that, right? You can be trialed. So you have this also this legal duty to do that. Next, please. So all these elements, morality, laws, and ethical decisions are part of what we call the normative frame, right? These are norms, symbolic norms regarding morality, positive norms regarding laws. And then within this context, you will make a decision. Next, please. Norms themselves are encompassed in a set of values, right? Norms 
are dependent on values. If you cherish democracy, all the norms that you will establish will be established in this democratic perspective, right? So you will set a specific uh, political system that will match your values, your expectation. Uh, you, you can see uh, there are some values, there are many others, depending on the country you live in, depending on a lot of things. Human rights are cherished, democracy is cherished, the rule of law is cherished, etc., 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 right? And also privacy, and I will go back to privacy a little bit later. So those norms depend highly on the values that are pre-existing to that. Next, please. When you have those values, they are themselves encompassed in a specific culture, right? They are the product of the cultural history or the cultural things that you've learned throughout history for years and, and, and centuries. Uh, I've put some words here. Um, if, if I talk about France and the West at, at large, I would say that we have we have uh, an hedonist culture, which is we, we like pleasure, right? We do not like suffering. We don't like that much effort. So um, uh, the, the more we can, we can have pleasure, leisure, the more we are happy. So there is this culture that is, uh, that is in France and in the West and Europe uh, at large. There is also this culture of technologies, technologies being seen as something that is related to progress and progress being seen as something that is really positive, that is needed. Then if you have this culture of progress saying that we have to move forward to a better environment, to a better kind of living, and if you feel like technology can help, then you will develop all the tools that are really important in that sense, right? And you will also obviously link them to your values. This is exactly what we're trying to do with artificial intelligence. We have this culture of technology as a mean toward progress. And we also feel like this technology should not be a problem when it comes to human rights, to democracy, the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. Next, please. Then this is the last, uh, the last circle, uh, which is, uh, next please, sorry. Uh, the last circle, which is also important is that all this works into a really wide environment. Obviously geopolitics, history, geography, resources are the kind of things that uh, will have an influence on your culture, which will have an influence in your values, et cetera, et cetera. Let me give you just one example that I've experienced myself. Um, uh, some years ago, I went to Israel uh, for a conference on, on uh, lethal autonomous weapons. And uh, what struck me when I was there is this feeling of all those people from Israel to be surrounded by enemies. This, you know, constant threat from all their neighbors. And obviously this has shaped a very specific uh, perspective on ethics to, uh, for, for, for the, the Israeli uh, Defense Force, which are labeled as the most moral forces in the world, right? And actually the way they see ethics is basically, I need to defend my interest against all those threats all around. And I will do whatever it takes to defend my interest, right? So there is no question about what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, as long as what I'm doing is for the sake of my country, of my community, I can do it, okay? And even if we're using some tools, some uh, let's say uh, means uh, that, that are not acceptable, that are not acceptable on a moral stance, that doesn't matter. They're really consequentialist, okay? Uh, I've also had this uh, really interesting uh, discussion with a, a, a friend of us, uh, Dr. Uh, Jassim Hadji, uh, who told me, uh, you have the luxury in the West to think about ethics. We don't have this luxury. We don't have time for that, right? We have to react to others. So the environment, the geopolitics can have a strong impact on the way you see the world, on the way you will shape your culture, your values, the norms, and obviously the way you will uh, react ethically. Let me give you another example that is uh, really uh, interesting. If we go to the circle of culture, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, left, yeah, left, left side that there is individualism. Okay, individualism is, is something that is quite developed in the West and uh, it, it's opposed to collectivism that you can find, for example, in some countries in Asia, right? So depending on the, on, on the culture that you have, if you're an individualistic person, then you will care about privacy that you can see on the value circle, okay? Because you're focused on yourself, 
and you feel like you deserve privacy, right? This is my individuality. This is part of me. I own some information, some data. So I really care about privacy. When you live in a collectivist uh, perspective, a collectivist uh, community, then privacy is something totally different. If you go to China, for example, privacy is not seen the way it is seen in the West. And there is no such thing as privacy per se in, in China. And not even going so far as China, I, I'm, I'm myself French and Canadian and I've lived in Canada. And I can tell you that in Canada, privacy does not have the same meaning as in France, right? When you talk about privacy in Canada, where communities are really important, this privacy is open to lots of other people than just yourself, right? For a French guy, privacy is me, that's it. And my interest, my pleasure. When you go to Canada, it's me, my family, my friends that can just come into my bubble and give me some, uh, let's say, advices in how to raise my kids and how to behave in, in such and such uh, situation. And obviously, when you have this idea of privacy and large privacy, the rule of law will be different. For example, it is acceptable in Canada to um, to to uh, I do say that in English, but to uh, to point out someone that has committed something that is not acceptable. Let's say that you leave your dog in the car. That's not acceptable. It's totally normal in Canada to call the police and say this gentleman or this lady uh, they left their dog in the car. Something that we cannot do in France because of our history, right? And we feel like that's not acceptable to denounce people and to. Uh, uh, to, to call the police because they, uh, they've committed something that is not acceptable. This is all about privacy and, and, and your bubble. So all those elements must be taken into account when we think about the governance of artificial intelligence. If you only focus on ethics and if you only focus on ethical norms that have been established mostly by the West, and that's really important, 70% of all the documents that have been issued so far pertaining to uh, ethics applied to AI are coming from the West, then you're missing important point and you're losing sight of the fact that this must be, all this reflection must be embedded in a cultural dimension. Uh, the thing that you're doing, if you just accept those rules that, that, that are coming from the West, is that you're denying your right to have your own culture, your own perspective on what privacy is. Uh, we're talking about, let's say, uh, equalities, right? And there is this strong sense, we've all talked about biases, equalities uh, between, let's say, males and females, right? Which is something that we value in the West. In some countries, that's not even a question. You do not think about equalities between male and female. We can disagree with that. We can find it maybe not acceptable, but what we cannot do is to deny the right to these people to think differently. So obviously, if they think differently, the way we have to treat women and, and men, at some point, their values will be different, their norms will be different, their ethical decision will be different. And we have to accept that. We have to admit the fact that our perspective is not unique and is definitely not the best. Because if we, are, uh, if we, if we do think that we have the best perspective in the world, what we're doing is we're doing a hierarchy of values, which is called in France, racism. Right. If I come to Brazil and I say, look, because I'm French, I have a really strong knowledge about what is acceptable and what is not. And they, I want you to adopt my perspective. What I'm doing is kind of a cultural uh, tyranny, cultural colonialism. Right. And we don't want that. So we really have to take all that into account and think that all those values that we have in the West are not shared all around the world. Right. Once again, we can disagree with that, that's not a, pro a problem. But what we cannot do is to deny others to have a different perspective. The same way I don't want Chinese people to deny me the right to have my own opinion on human rights or on democracy, okay? Really important. Next one, please. Uh, please, please, my friend, Paul, uh, let, let, let me know when uh, when I'm uh, out of time, right? Because okay, okay. okay, let's go, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. And, and obviously, uh, as you can see with this circle, uh, it is a continuous, you know, uh, relation between all those different uh, levels, right? It's not just morality that is influencing norms, etc. It's morality that is influencing norms, which is influencing morality. Then at all the levels, 
uh, you, you can see exactly the same. So all this is moving, is changing. And it's something that is really difficult for us to understand is that what is acceptable today might not be acceptable in 10 years, let's say, right? Uh, lots of things that were accepted. Let's, let's take an, a French example. Uh, death penalty was accepted for a long time in France, right? But the morality, the values, the culture, the environment had changed at a point where uh, in the late 1980-81, we've decided that death penalty was no longer acceptable, right? And maybe, and now we hear, here and there in France, that maybe death penalty is not something that is that bad. So you see that our values are evolving a long time uh, or a long history, which is totally normal. And then if our values are evolving, then our ethical behaviors will change as well right so this is something that is moving all the time really slow pace obviously we're not changing our perspective every 10 days but i mean on the long run something that is acceptable today will no longer be acceptable in 10 years and vice versa okay next please uh, so far, what we know, and, and, and this is the, uh, the, uh, the legal norm, is that uh, the UNESCO, uh, in its Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversities, has stated clearly that the defense of cultural diversity is an ethical imperative. And I, I would say that this is a general statement that has been made in 2001 at a time where AI was not really in the scope of most of us. Uh, but this ethical imperative regarding the respect and the defense of cultural diversity must be definitely used and applied strictly when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, that, that's really, really important to, to, uh, to make sure that, and especially when we're trying to find a way to, uh, uh, to create a global governance of artificial intelligence, that we are not making this big mistake that we are making here currently in the West, which is to develop a universal code of ethics, because there is no such thing as a universal code of ethics that is possible, uh, except if at some point you impose your own perspective on others and you deny them once again, the right to have a different perspective. So this idea of a universal code of ethics is a clear violation of this request and this, um, uh, this, this strong demand by the, uh, by the UN to defend cultural diversity as an ethical imperative. Next, please. Uh, as, as I told you, uh, my concern regarding all that is that so far, 70% of all the documents uh, have been, have been uh, issued by, uh, by the West, while the West represents barely 15% of the whole population in the world, right? So my question is, okay, my, you might not like China, that's not the point, but where is China? 19% of the, the whole population. Where is Africa? 15% of the world population. Where is India? 17 to 18% of the world population. So how is that possible that such a big amount of documents have been issued, prepared, created by such a small amount of people? Because when I say 15% of the world population regarding the West, you obviously uh, imagine that uh, within this 15 person, there is only a small amount of people that are working on AI ethics, not the whole Western world, only small amount of people in academia, in public sector, in the private sector that are working on that, meaning that you have a really small part of the world that is, you know, uh, telling the rest of the world what is acceptable and what is not when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence. And this is where I'm, I'm really happy to see that Brazil, even if Brazil has a, has a strong Western culture, I'm really happy to see that Brazil is really interested in this cultural dimension. We have some example of this interest for cultural dimension. When you go to New Zealand, for example, they have taken into account the Maori culture in the reflection about how to deal with data and this kind of things. Uh, in, in some other places, I'm working with Morocco, they're also really interested in this kind of issues. Uh, Bahrain is really interested in this kind of issues. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to see that in some places, this cultural dimension uh, is, is now really present. But I think that we are really at the beginning. If we go on, next please, if we go on with this, uh, uh, with what we're doing uh, currently, uh, we, 
we are running a strong risk of you know, uh, cultural tensions. And we can see that already between China and the US. I don't know if you've heard about that, but there has been this meeting between uh, US diplomats and Chinese diplomats in Anchorage in Alaska at the very beginning of the year, and where China basically uh, said to the US, okay, we are fed up with you lecturing us on democracy. You have your perspective on democracy. We have our perspective on democracy. Obviously, we can disagree with the, the way uh, China uh, sees democracy, but we also can disagree with the way the US is seeing democracy. But once again, we cannot deny the fact that China first is a big power, uh, well, be certainly the leader in AI, and then that we, you cannot lecture a big power at some point that will create strong tension. That's true with China. That would be true with Saudi Arabia. That would be true with a lot of countries, maybe with Brazil at some point, with lots of countries that are imposing themselves as leaders, regional leaders or world leaders uh, in, in, uh, in AI. Second, the problem is that we are violating, as, as, as I told you uh, earlier, uh, we are violating international norms uh, regarding the respect for uh, cultural diversity that you can find also in the UN Charter. So it's not only the UNESCO, it's also in the UN Charter. Uh, it's also a violation of our own moral standards because we are uh, obviously totally opposed to any kind of biases. But at the same time, we are imposing the Western bias on ethics to the rest of the world, right? So we are going against our moral standards. We are jeopardizing the AI global governance because once again, I feel like if we really go towards this idea of a universal code of ethics, what we will create is something that will not be applied, such as you know the universal declaration of human rights that are here. We are all happy with that. But when we look at all the countries, France included, we do not respect those standards. So what's the point with having standards that are not respected? And I guess that if we impose this code of, uh, of, uh, of ethics, universal code of ethics to the rest of the world, most of the countries that will sign it for diplomatic reason will not apply it, right? And that would be pointless. So I guess it's better to have a multilateral discussion on culture, even if it's not perfect. That would not be perfect. There is no perfect solution. I think it would be definitely uh, less risky than imposing a, a unique perspective or some perspective. Um, I, will, I will stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention. I guess uh, we've, uh, we've already covered lots of things. Okay, wonderful prof philosopher, Emmanuel, thanks a lot. It's the first time that we are together. It's why I think it's, the webinar was in, in March, Professor Thiago, the March, yes in March that we are together and the first time that uh, I have listened about a multicultural approach of the artificial intelligence. It's so important in one of the, your slides that you shown us that the core of the all, all system in artificial intelligence is the intersect the ethics intersection of the law and the morality. And oh, it's fantastic. the core the core of some of, of, of when everything began and uh, what you say the different perspe uh, perspective of privacy like a french a french guy and a, 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 a canadian a canadian guy it's individual it's the family and it's a great honor for me and tiago to take part in your global ai institute that uh, the proposal is to discuss the multicultural approach of ai ethics and no, so, uh, and your presentation is a gift for us but uh, we'll we'll listen tiago to coach on tina to discuss a little bit and professor tiago é, vou falar em português ele é professor ele é é PhD pela Universidade Presbiteriana Mackenzie e aprovado com suma cum laude, que não é para qualquer um. É, realizou o estágio de pós-doutorado no Mediterrâneo International Center for Human Rights Research. Nós fomos colegas lá, nós nos conhecemos. É, em Rédio Calabria, Rédio Calabria, Itália. E mestre em Direito pela Universidade Católica de Santos, pela Unisantos, com bolsa integral da CAPES, aprovado também com suma cum laude ou seja, onde evidencia toda a sua dedicação ao, aos cursos que se propôs, com, pós, com algumas pós-graduações, várias até, e, inclusive com gestão pública municipal, é professor da UNIP, da Uni, Universidade de São Judas, pesquisador, não sei onde arranja há tanto tempo, pesquisador do Centro de Estudos Sociedade e Tecnologia, da, também da USP, expert em board member 
Globo AI Ethics, vice-presidente presidente lá em Guarujá, do CMDCA, e conselheiro, junto a conselhos municipais do, do, em Guarujá, também em São Paulo, avaliador do INEP, entre inúmeras outras, servidor municipal também. And, Thiago, it's a great pleasure for us to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Paulo. Thank you very much, Professor Emmanuel. I'm so honored to be here with you. Congrats to UDF for this fantastic and amazing event. I'm not sure if I'm I'm current on the on the screen right now. It's 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 okay. Everything is okay. Okay. Me. Okay. You have a nice. slide that to have a, a translate system here. Okay, fantastic. Uh, and now, now I get it. Uh, thank you. And uh, Manuel, it's always fantastic to hear you. It's always a pleasure. And this is the first time that I hear you, Professor Manuel, uh, talking about this this intersection between law and ethics, and which here in Brazil we uh, studied it a lot. Uh, it was a great presentation, Francisco, indeed. And I do believe here in Brazil, the undergraduate students uh, in law schools in general are uh, kind of uh, used it to, to see these, these uh, slides that you presented to us. If you have uh, introduction to law 101, you do uh, get this difference between uh, approaches and ethics, uh, this framework approaches in ethics and law. And it was amazing, it was fantastic to see it once more and to hear you talking about explaining this uh, so nice, so well. Uh, and this is the first thing that I'd like to share. Professor Emmanuel was fantastic in his presentation, uh, established some connection between um, um, uh, some connections between law and ethics. And this is indeed, my dear friends, uh, what uh, is proposed on a post-positivism uh, perspective of law, analytical law school. Congrats indeed, Daniela. He is amazing. Mm -hmm. Professor Emmanuel is fantastic. And, and this post-positivist experience, this post-positivist analytic school, my dear friends, it's here in Brazil in general. And, and this is uh, it, it's quite uh, fundamental for us to get for the precise uh, reason that Professor Manuel shared with us, the, the need for us to understand, the, uh, to understand, to get all those values uh, that are behind uh, a normative structure this is quite important for us. So, uh, if we understand the, the law and the normative of law in general, it is not enough to get the, 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 the reasons of the law, the spirit of the law, the, the spirit de loi. Uh, and this is quite fundamental for us to understand that uh, the, the principles that uh, enunciate the law uh, must be uh, understood and realized by a, a standards defined by principles and not the normative and rules per se. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about uh, principles and, and rules and uh, this positivist, post positivist perspective. I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence, my dear friends. And, and to talk about ethics and artificial intelligence, it is for us a great honor to be part of Global AI Ethics Institute that Professor Emmanuel are one of the founders. And in, in this and in these institutes and these programs that I current research artificial intelligence and new technologies as, as the postdoc, as the CEST at USP, USP all those, we are currently studying some, um, how does um, artificial intelligence and technologies inf uh, get influential on our lives? And I can share with you two different perspectives. 
uh, of it. The first perspective of artificial intelligence that we must to understand in our lives, it's undoubtedly uh, the, the need of uh, protection of uh, fundamental rights, okay? And it's quite, uh, it's quite connected with uh, ethics and, and all those uh, fantastic values that Professor Manuel was enunciating right now. When we understand the artificial intelligence, we realize we get the artificial intelligence. Uh, Paulo, you not want to say something or uh, it just clapping? Okay, no. I uh, see your oh, hand. Yes, here. yes, uh, yes. Okay, no, okay, no, okay, no, okay. Yes. you're <laughs> clapping. Fantastic. Uh, no problem. And when you, when we understand uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental rights. I'm sorry. When we understand fundamental rights as a center uh, perspective of uh, artificial intelligence protection, we must understand how does artificial intelligence can be uh, organized. And I, I'm. I like I like to to see to uh, to perceive artificial intelligence in two different uh, groupments or two different groups. Um, it's it's one way to establish this division, this understanding of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. The first group of artificial intelligence we can name it as uh, GUFI good old fashioned artificial intelligence. And for you, my dear friends, who understand a little bit of uh, encoding, of uh, general ideas of encoding, you do get this GUFI, good old fashioned artificial intelligence, is more based on a, a if and else programming, uh, programming type. Uh, Professor Paulo here uh, will, will, will clarify this much better than myself. I do understand uh, the basics on it, but uh, Professor Paulo must to, to understand this quite better than myself. And, and Professor Paulo has a degree on, no, on tech. I'm a student, I'm a student. Oh, <laughs> quite soon, quite soon, my friend, quite soon. Uh, you will soon have it. And, and this GUFI, this good old fashioned artificial intelligence, as I mentioned, are uh, quite large programming codes because it's, it's mandatory for the programmer to conceive all the perspectives of the, the interaction with the public in general. And so this, this must be a, a quite large encoding. And okay. This is one group, this is one aspect of, of artificial intelligence. But the second uh, group of artificial intelligence, uh, it's machine learning. And machine learning is quite more trickier than the other the GUFI. Why? Because machine learning deals with, uh, machine learning deals with uh, data, big data indeed. And this big data came from, or comes from uh, somewhere. And this is precisely where this first uh, perspective of protection, artificial intelligence and, and interaction with law must be uh, understood. When we are dealing with artificial intelligence, ma machine learning and big data, uh, there are must there must be some boundaries that uh, the law must provide to guarantee a some privacy to guarantee some um, some uh, protection of uh, uh, individual rights so when we brazilians have in our uh, article 5 of brazilians constitutional uh, the the individual rights these kind of rights must be protected on, on, on a horizontal perspective, on a horizontal level, okay? So when we understand this, this necessity, we are current dealing with, naturally, we are current dealing with ethics in a legal perspective. But this is not the only case here. As I've mentioned when I begin this, this exposition, uh, I, I propose to you 
two different approaches on artificial intelligence interaction with uh, ethics and law. The first approach, as I've mentioned, uh, law must be a, a boundary, uh, impose boundary limits to the artificial intelligence enthusiast to not uh, to not to um, um, violate. I have no other word uh, to violate uh, our individual rights. I will explain this why this happens in a little bit. The second, the second perspective of artificial intelligence use and this relation with ethics that I'd like to share with you, it's not a, a, a per se a protection, but is as a tool, a really tool for optimization and, and to get our lives, I guess, a little bit better, to establish public policies and maybe as we at society could have some gains in general for this artificial intelligence use. So my dear friends from, from that are current hearing us right now, we are in two different fronts. Artificial intelligence use as a tool to have our lives better as a optimization for the public policies, new public policies, the current public policies that uh, the state provide for us as one front. And the other front, as I mentioned, uh, artificial intelligence as a, a a factor to be observed and limited to, to in concern of the individual fundamental rights, okay? Those two fronts, I guess, are the most uh, important fronts that we must face in artificial intelligence, okay? Well, um, from the second front, this last that I've mentioned right now, I guess it's not that difficult to understand how artificial intelligence can improve our uh, current life. Uh, we have some um, fantastic examples here in Brazil, for instance, the use of artificial intelligence in the judiciary branch and lawsuits. We have uh, the usage of artificial intelligence as a chatbot, you know, and when we must to, 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 ask some, some chatbot something. We have our personal assistance. We have, well, the, the use is uh, numerous to say the least. And this is not the quite uh, thematic, or the, the quite central thematic that I'd like to share with you because uh, we must to face it, it at some, maybe another time. But, the first perspective, and uh, the first perspective of indeed uh, data, big data use was, is, I mean, on our major concern. Okay, why? Yesterday, not in a week, not in a month, yesterday, we have faced our, ourselves with a journalistic news that uh, Facebook were uh, eventually allegedly uh, using um, posts and political posts as a, a, a uh, how can I say this, as, as a instrument to keep uh, the public engaged on Facebook platform. I mean, this is quite obvious, you know, and this kind of posts that uh, rely and make some people to interact and to keep online, to keep connected on Facebook was the precise motif, was the precise reason why we must to, to have some uh, boundaries uh, on artificial intelligence and big data usage. Why? This, this artificial intelligence, as I've mentioned, this artificial intelligence in general tools 
uh, our uh, machine learning tools are uh, currently using uh, big data as a, a factor of uh, improve themselves, improve their response, okay? And to improve their response, it could be something fantastic to have some uh, better response in general on all those aspects, but also can be something quite uh, not good, to say the least, not good at all. Why? Uh, big data with the advancement. Of, okay, I will read this later, Francisco. I'm sorry, it, it get cut here. Okay, I'll read this later. The first perspective, data protection. This is quite something for us to, to, to understand and the importance. Data protection, the second point, to establish some kind of bubbles that uh, this news from yesterday, uh, this bubble, this, this kind of situation that yesterday was uh, announced uh, on, on the news in general, okay? Data protection, it is something that we here in Brazil, we couldn't have at some point at least, from our LG Lei Geral de Proteção de Dados, general law from that of data protection here in Brazil, okay? And this, uh, this is precise the mo motif, the precise the reason why, this, the, why do we have this kind of instrument, legal instrument. We must to have some protection of our privacy despite the fact that all those data, all these data, I'm sorry, must to, uh, be used to improve artificial intelligence. Why so? Why does this data must to be used to improve uh, artificial intelligence? Usually, my friends, artificial intelligence can, and does our, our current using, uh, machine learning are currently using big data to establish a prediction. Uh, it, is, it is mathematics, it is statistical, and for having, to have in the better prediction, we must, to, uh, we must to get better data in all moment, moments and all those reasons. So my friends, we must to have all those data uh, we must to have all those data and with all those data we have better response from artificial intelligence but to have this data it is mandatory to to go on our privacy okay you are against it Thiago you are against uh, the data providing no, I'm not against at all. You can use Facebook, Google, YouTube, uh, uh, by all means. I don't have any problem with that. I do use some um, social media uh, myself. Not all, but I use some social media myself. But uh, you must understand what you are going on when you sign in uh, Facebook, when you sign in YouTube, when you sign in on Google, when you use all those thing, things, you must understand that you are contributing with uh, our big data and artificial intelligence to, to improve the, the results. And this is the precise reason why you have, when you are looking, you are looking for, uh, for instance, uh, you know, I don't know, you want a, note, a notebook, a laptop, you do you do go you Google it uh, better prices on the, the so and so laptop, and then you do receive some fantastic uh, results on and on and on and on Facebook and all those media because of the cooks because of all those interactions in big, big data. This is privacy. You are uh, willing willing open hand willing delivering our privacy your privacy 
to those uh, to those companies. Okay. Okay. If you don't have any problem with that, no problem at all. But you must to understand this. This is this aspect. And the second point that I've mentioned, it is the, the, the need and the insurance of uh, get, uh, get connected with those platforms, with those social media uh, tools, as I've mentioned. And uh, this is quite uh, debated on the social network. If I'm not wrong, this is the name of the movie. And this is the fantastic uh, documentary. If you don't see, go, go as soon as possible to see it. I'm not sure if it is the, the, the right name, but uh, if, if I'm not wrong, you can Google it at some point and, and see and check if I'm, I'm, I'm corrected. The social network explores quite much uh, the, those news that was uh, delivered for everyone yesterday. Uh, those platforms and the data usage um, keep us, um, um, at some point we can say, uh, connected, engaged on those uh, social media tools because they must to, to deliver their product and there must to be a, a connection, a real connection uh, with uh, us to do it so. It's a kind of manipulation. It is a kind of um, uh, cognitive dissonance uh, comportment. Uh, this is a kind of... Um, uh, um, collective, um, collective action, and this this must be understand and as possible not to be perpetuated. And the law probably uh, have this not okay, not easy task to realize to maybe uh, establish some boundaries and to um, evidentiate it to all the society all those problems or all those situations for us to freely choose this is the main point of this exposition and I'm finishing it right now. The, the, the need of the society of understanding all those aspects that are not so easily understood, understood and perceived for everyone. So probably uh, is up to the law to face it to delivery it to the society and to uh, improve a level a different level of, of of conscience for everyone in the society to understand what's going on this kind of artificial intelligence tool my dear friends this is privacy this is uh, indeed uh, protection of fundamental rights in the horizontal level. And this is some of the future, future challenges that we are uh, currently facing and already facing it. Uh, Professor Emmanuel and myself, uh, we are debating this, uh, this bill artificial intelligence bill, Brazilian artificial intelligence bill uh, in a couple of weeks ago. And we, we are, were at that time discussing some of these uh, interesting aspects. We, mu we must at least expect some fundamental rights uh, are, are maybe uh, is created to, yep, Consideration of machine learning remind me Amazon. I didn't get all those all, all those interventions. I'm going to read it 
quite soon. And we are debating the, the need of the law to, to establish this kind of boundaries and to, to uh, so the society can understand what's going on behind us. I guess that's it, Professor Paulo. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if uh, there is any mistake, but I guess in general it is. It's wonderful, 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 uh, Professor Thiago. Uh, in the beginning, eh, we are talking about the soccer team, PSG is the team of our philosopher Emmanuel Goffi. And there we have a pair there, yeah, we talk about, talked about uh, Messi and Neymar in the soccer team there. And there we have a pair so brilliant like them, Professor Emmanuel and Professor Thiago. So congratulations, both of you. Like your, our, our pair in the soccer team, we have a, a brilliant pair here. Talk about ethics and artificial intelligence. We, uh, must, we must you talk about Palmeiras, hein? Uh, don't, <laughs> no, don't you forget no, Palmeiras. No, yes, no, but, but we are, I, I am Flamengo. <laughs> no, we go in the, in the, in the final uh, of Libertadores. Uh, Fantastic. The professor, it's, it's wonderful, uh, both of presentation. And I, I would like to hear a, a little uh, more from uh, Professor Emmanuel. Professor Emmanuel, you are, you are, you have you show show us uh, uh, ex excellent slide that you show that only fifteen percent of the population establishes seventeen percent of the the rules of the road that uh, influenced by the Western people and one of my concern of my wonder that in the state of law that we have uh, we are. Normally, we are motivated that we see something in, in a country that uh, feels good, a law, a effective laws in a country, and you try to take it, that law and establish in your country. And sometimes it's not effectiveness like the other country. It's, it's obvious that you, you show us because uh, the, the culture, our ethics is different. And I, I, one of the top that you, you talk for us that uh, I have been I have been research about artificial intelligence, data protection, and our, our postdoc pro, uh, program that me and Thiago were together. And I I I I, I want only one one question in China China people in in, in China country the the the, the recognition face facial recognition is imposed by, uh, by them. And how you, you, you think, and everything that I have been reading, that it's no problem that they are accept that situation, that in the culture uh, of that, that people, uh, to a rule that imposed to the, the facial recognition, it's not a problem for, for them. But I think that you will be very different in other countries, in the Western culture. And, and, in, 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 in your, how uh, you are a, a friend, uh, wow, how, you uh, how you think that uh, French people will accept this imposed, um, a rule that established that uh, all facial re recognition is imposed by them? How you feel that the people will react, react by them? Uh, that, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, actually, so far, people are really reluctant to have this kind of facial recognition, but that's paradoxical. That's really paradoxical because uh, at the same time, we like to be sure that we are protected. And at some point, this is exactly the point that has been made in China, but also in Japan, right? They're using facial recognition or CCTV uh, control uh, for security reason. Just to say, let's say that you're assaulted in the street we can recognize and find the people who did that uh, quite uh, easily, right? So there is this security uh, uh, security aspect that is really important. Uh, most of the French people, if you ask them, would say, I do not agree with that because I fear that uh, maybe the data that will be used could be used in a way that is not really acceptable, but also because they don't know how those data will be used. And, and also because, and this is when you think uh, in the long run, you say, uh, what would happen if in 
two years or next year in France, there will be the presidential election. But let's say next year or maybe for the next election, uh, we have an extremist party that would come to be, you know, uh, the major party. What will, how will they use this kind of tool at some point? So people are really reluctant. But that's only statement because when you go deeper into that, when you really speak with people, they know that we are already, you know, not um, not controlled by camera. But you know that all our data are already available. We are ourselves. You were talking about Facebook. We we're talking about all those uh, social network. We are already giving up our data to those systems without any consideration of what will those. Uh, uh, groups, small, big companies will do with those data. So there is kind of, uh, I would not say hypocrisy, but there is a lack of understanding of what it is all really about. So we are fearing things that are kind of obvious. I'm looking at you, I'm controlling you, surveilling you, and I feel like that's not acceptable, but that's exactly the same to be controlled by a camera than to give lots of information online. My, my fear is that uh, we are slowly uh, acculturated to that. And maybe, and I, I, I will take the bet right now, I would say that we discussed that in 10 years, people will be less reluctant than they are now because we are already using facial recognition in some metro old stand, you know, uh, station here in Paris. <clears throat> we are using facial recognition in the south of France in buses for security reason. So, uh, I, I myself, I served the French Air Force for 27 years, and I've seen that with drones. At the very beginning, when we're talking about drones that were used by the CIA in the tribal zone in Pakistan, French people were really reluctant to have French drones because we feared that at some point they would be used in a bad way. That was, let's say, uh, in the 2010s, right? 2020, 2020, 2010, sorry, 2012. Uh, but now, when you talk about drones, it's no longer a problem. We have armored drones in Mali. No one is concerned about that. We are using drones everywhere all the time. So the thing is that we've been slowly a culture to that. And we will be a culture to AI. And we will be a culture to surveillance, tracking, CCTV at some point. And for the coming generation, being controlled by camera will no longer be an issue. Right. So this is also the paradox of all the things, and especially when it comes to responsibility, we are saying we need to have, and I do agree with Tiago, that we need laws, that ethics is not enough. That's only a first step towards something that is much more constraining. And we are advancing the fact that we have a responsibility toward next generation. But the funny thing, uh, philosophically speaking, is that we don't know what the next generation will expect. We don't know, maybe the next generation will be really happy with CCTV, surveillance, facial recognition, and these kind of things. We don't know, right? So this is the paradox that we have to deal with when we talk about AI and the potential use of data or facial recognition is that most of us, we don't know what it is about. Most of us, we don't know what could be the consequences, bad or good consequences of it, right? So we fear it like we fear Terminator just because we see the wrong side, the bad side. But as long as you will be slowly a culture, you will, be, you will get used to hear about that, you will accept it. And once again, my bet is that in 10 years, people won't be uh, really uh, concerned about AI or, or maybe they won't be concerned about, about facial recognition. Okay, thank you, Professor Thiago. Uh, yes, um, fantastic. W Professor Emmanuel just shared with us. I had a contact with a friend from Greece, Professor Spiros Kokolax, and this Professor Spiros Kokolax uh, uh, enlightened us about uh, privacy paradox. That's precisely what Professor Emmanuel was uh, current mention right now. We want to be at Facebook, we want to be at YouTube, we want to be at, uh, I don't know, Google, etc. But, but we are not so sure about to, to, to freely uh, uh, given our data, our personal data. And at some point, but at other point, we will freely 
give our data to all those companies. The same here about uh, the, the facial recognition that Professor Emmanuel was just uh, mentioned. I do recommend you, if you can read and you can uh, research Professor Spiros Kokolax about uh, article about uh, privacy paradox. This is the first thing. And the second point that I'd like to highlight what Professor Emmanuel just told us, it's about the, 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 uh, the, the how can I put this, uh, the function of the law. I guess I don't have any better word than this. What does uh, the law uh, is about? The first and obvious reason is to provide obedience to the population in general. This is the first uh, thing that goes on our our heads, when, our minds when we, we discuss the function of the law. But the second point, uh, at, at least here in Brazil, it's quite common. The second point uh, of the law uh, meaning it's the the to highlight to all the society the importance of that thematic this specific subjective subjective this is specific matters so you student undergraduate student you uh, phd student you master student when you face you must face and to understand the the, the meaning of the law you must to perceive that the the law have must have naturally a obedience meaning one hand, on the other hand, there is a value of these. And here in Brazil, I, I like to, to point this out. It's quite important. Here in Brazil, law has a lot of um, values, uh, meaning, and much more. Uh, we see these in, in criminal law in general all the times, but the law here in Brazil, we use a lot as a tool of improving our values to take some um, ethical value, to take some ax axiological value and to put this on a normative uh, structure of law. This is quite interesting if you understand jurisprudence, if you are studying um, uh, philosophy of the law in general. Uh, that's what that were my my consideration, Paulo. Oh, excellent. Only two more to consideration. Uh, Professor Manuel told us two points: uh, drones and transparency. And one my one of my concern that uh, the other webinar we talked about the the holocaust that uh, we have a different uh, situation in france in netherlands uh, france uh, uh, sent uh, 25 percent of the jewish people to concentration camp and netherlands 75 percent of the jewish people for a holocaust camp it's the, it's the, the difference because uh, netherlands has had the control of the, the data of the religion of their people much more effective than France. And we, have, and we had a, a resident move, residence moving, movement and in France that make the, all the difference. If you go no, not so far in the past, now we have artificial intelligence and we have drones and we, a, a lot of books that I have been reading they are exposed to the danger of it, of it, and they told us and remember us the book from 1948 that called 1984 for George Orwell. And Elon Musk, uh, one, one, one moment, told that the artificial intelligence, intelligence, like something from from the evil. And, and what 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 your reflection, uh, Professor Manuel and Thiago, uh, about this situation of uh, drones, no transparency at all in the country, the use of our data, and how dangerous it may be for us. 
uh, really interesting consideration, um, and and, uh, and and it's it's really relevant, uh, uh, my friend, to to make this this link with the Holocaust and 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 uh, the, the Second World War history. Uh, obviously, if 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 what happened in in 1939, 1945, uh, would happen again in France uh, or in any other country, that would be way more easier to, to to get information on who is what and what who is doing what right now even if in france it is strictly forbidden to get information about religious beliefs or political stances right it's perfectly uh, uh forbidden to to get information on that but i guess even if it's forbidden that's easy to get them once again we're talking about social uh, network uh, we we actually deliver our all all lives on on, on the web, so it would be really yeah. easy to get in such such information. So that that's pretty concerning, definitely. Uh, the other point is is to say that uh, I would say that we, we we must be really careful not to mixing up the tool and the objective, right? Controlling population is something that is not related to AI. It has always existed it already exists uh, Tiago was relevantly talking about the laws as a way to control population and to make sure that people are behaving in a specific way uh, this is one of the tools that we can use right you can say okay these are the limits when you go out of these limits you will be suited you will be trialed and there will be a sanction right so it's a way also to say to the people you have to walk on this path not outside of the path right uh, there is also philosophically speaking something that is been called by French philosopher uh, Michel Foucault, governmentality. And governmentality is a way to control people without using you know, physical violence. So it's something that has been here for centuries. When you are um, a sovereign, when you want to govern the country, you have to use some tools that are in your hands in order to make sure that people will act in a specific way. That's not linked with AI. AI is just one new tool in the hands of those who want to govern the country, right? So yeah. I, I feel like obviously it makes things maybe easier and it goes faster when you want to control, but at the same time, and this is also something that we have to take into account is that with all the data that are available now, right? Of some, someone told me quite recently that in the past 10 years, the number of data that have been gathered have been multiplied by nine. That's great. That's cool. And you, you, can, you, can, you can be like, okay, that's really scary. But at the same time, that's not enough. You need to use those data. You need to, I mean, analyze them. So you need a workforce. You need the tools because you have such an amount of data that at some point that's pointless, right? It's, it's like if you, if you read a, a, a wall a dictionary, a thesaurus uh, or, or an encyclopedia, that's pointless if you're not able to understand what is important, what is not to make inferences and to make conclusions. So the, 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 the amount of data that we can gather is one thing, but our ability to use this huge amount of data and, and to analyze it and to use it for specific consequences is another problem that we have in the military. And you were talking about drones. Uh, when I was in, the, in the, 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 the French Air Force, that was a big issue. We were always doing intelligence, just gathering data, 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 data. And at some point, we did not have enough people to analyze <laughs> those data. So that, OK, you get data, but what's the point? And you, you can discuss that with the CIA and the FBI regarding terrorism. They get thousands, they get tons of data, right? So what's the point? There are still terrorist attacks, right? So we also have to, to be really nuanced about that. So first, once again, this idea of controlling people is not directly related to AI is something that is related with government, right? And it already exists and it existed. It's been existing for a long time. And then AI is just a tool for that. And the second thing, as I was saying, is that, uh, yeah, maybe you can give data to the people, but uh, they won't be able to use them relevantly, right? Okay, thank you, Professor Thiago. Yes, uh, this is a fantastic thematic. And I guess Professor Manuel uh, just uh, explained the right the situation, the right reasons of it, uh, uh, AI, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, um, use are all, always is on our society and always will be in our society. I guess uh, it's not anything new at all. As you mentioned on this, this unfortunately and sadly example of World War II. But um, 
this is precisely Paulo, Professor Manuel, my friend. This is precisely why we here have in Brazil uh, Lei Geral de Proteção de Dados, LGPD, and this general law for data, data protection. And in, in our legislation, in our law, there is some uh, article that mentions the, the, the need of protecting uh, sensitive data. And this is precisely this sensitive data. Why do you want to know what religion I am practicing, practicing sorry, right now? Why do you want to know this kind of sensitive information? Do you are or are you aware of the responsibility to gain this kind of data? Uh, Paulo, I, I must to 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 share with you some um, some uh, human resources, uh, at least here in Brazil. I don't know how the, it does on Europe, but here in Brazil, it's quite common, Emmanuel, uh, and the human resources interview to to know what does religion, what does and so and so. Why do you want to know all those personal informations? Are you uh, prepared to 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 take to protect this personal, the sensitive information, the sensitive data, or you just want to know to to have it, to have some kind of intelligence as Emmanuel was uh, just mentioned right now. Uh, it's something that are not okay, at least for me. And I don't understand the reason of it at some points and probably the, the the companies here in Brazil, at least the, the companies that I, I've uh, gained contact uh, to, to instruct about this kind of situation, uh, does not understand at all also. Unfortunately, they do not get the importance of uh, this, the protecting of this kind of uh, data. And we, when uh, situations like we see also yesterday, or uh, I don't know if it was on Monday, not recall it, then doesn't matter. And when we see uh, data leaking from different, uh, different institutions here in Brazil, data who supposedly must be, would and should be protected, and it is not current properly protected at all, unfortunately. Uh, Paulo, mind if I uh, make a brief commentary on Meiliani's uh, yeah. uh, question. Uh, she asked about labor 4.0, Meiliani, fantastic question. Meiliani, I do believe uh, that indeed we are current, um, facing some new, new times, uh, brave new worlds, just to be more precise. And I guess artificial intelligence can be a tool of improving all aspects of, of uh, our society. I don't, I don't um, have any problem with that. And as a, a tech, any technological revolution, as we face on the 18th, 19th century, we already faced this on other times, uh, we must to adapt at some new points. It's not uh, feasible to, to not, do not implement artificial intelligence in our current society, because eventually uh, some people will lose their jobs. The jobs must, the people and the persons behind these jobs must to adapt, must to study, must to be prepared to deal with this, this new technologies. Okay, this is at least my opinion. I know it's it's tough, but uh, uh, so is progress. People are not deal uh, proper deal with uh, by the government. The government must. To, to incentive must to, to, to establish some nice public policies on work to implement in artificial intelligence. It is something that we are all must to deal at some point. Paulo, thank you. Okay. 
Excellent. Professor Emanuel, our chief né, in the Global AI Institute. Yep. And Professor Tiago, it's an excellent, fantastic morning here. And I would like, in the name of the University Center, to thank uh, Professor Tiago and Emanuel. We hope to stay together soon. Uh, maybe a presence, uh, not, on, not only online, uh, it's physical and physically in, in France, in Brazil. And I would like to, to thank you, Professor Emanuel. I know your busy schedule and, and separate a time uh, to stay with us, like my friend Tiago, my colleague in a postdoctoral program in, in Italy. And thank you and have a good day, have a good time and stay in touch. Professor Manuel. Thank th th thanks to you, Paolo. That was a really great honor to be with you again. And then I, I really hope that we will meet here in Paris or uh, anywhere in Brazil. That would just be fantastic. And I think that would be a fantastic time for all of us. And thank you, Tiago, for, for being here. And thanks for all of uh, those people that were here uh, listening to us. Thank you. Okay. Professor Tiago. You know. Thank you, Professor Paulo, once more for the invitation. And uh, thank you all students who are uh, are here with us right now, until right now. Uh, Emmanuel knows that I love to hear your thoughts on all those all those things. Thank you very much for sharing this all this knowledge with us. Thank you very much once more, my friends. It's fantastic to to have it here from you. If you want, I will to, uh, will share this in Portuguese. Uh, se vocês quiserem, eu tô lá no, no, tanto no LinkedIn, deixei lá meu link, deixei no YouTube também. Fiquem à vontade para nos acompanhar. A gente está sempre com novidades boas, novidades interessantes. I've just mentioned, Emmanuel, that uh, my LinkedIn and my YouTube account to, to be followed if they want. Uh, thank you very much, Paulo. And um, uh, Professor Manuel has also LinkedIn, Emmanuel Gofi, only put the research term lá, Emmanuel Gofi, and you'll find uh, Professor Manuel. Thank you. Good afternoon, have a good time. Boa tarde a todos e tenham um, um bom dia. Uma bossa. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.